Gresham College presents The Dark Eyes of London by Cathy Unsworth. I wandered through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. Although it was written over 200 years ago, William Blake's London still seems to surmise the motivation of the writers I want to talk about today. Since their 19th century beginnings, there have been two distinct types of crime fiction abroad in our capital. There are those, like the original Penny Dreadfuls, that make entertainments out of murder. Then there are those for whom the city is an integral force in the larger picture. Those who, like Blake, observe their times from the bottom up, with the realisation that the biggest criminals who walks amongst us are usually the ones put in charge. This is this mix of the great and the good with the down and the dirty, living in closer proximity here than perhaps any other city on earth that fascinates them. The writers I'm going to talk about have all used their work to ask serious questions about the psyche of our times. They share an affinity with the damaged and neglected, an urge to take those responsible for public policy to task, and a need to understand how the past impacts upon the present. Perhaps most crucially, None of them felt comfortable in the worlds they were born into or the past, took the past they were supposed to have taken. Maybe only an outsider can ever look in with such clarity. In London, time seems to loop. There are always echoes of previous generations in the work of these writers, <clears throat> as if authors instinctively pick up the threads their predecessors left, which is why this talk will have a habit of ping-ponging backwards even as it moves forwards. Because my story doesn't begin in the present, but in the time that irrevocably shaped the way we live now, and with a writer whose reaction to all of that would change the course of crime fiction and what it could be used for. In the fateful year of 1984, Derek Raymond's He Died With His Eyes Open was a devastating realisation of Margaret Thatcher's curse, There's No Such Thing As Society, from its first line on. He was found in the shrubbery in front of the World of God House in Albatross Road, West Five. It was the 30th of March during the evening rush hour. It was bloody cold and an office worker had tripped over the body when he was caught short going home. I don't know if you know Albatross Road where it runs into Hangar Lane, but if you do, you'll appreciate what a ghastly lonely area it is, with the surface level tube station on one side of the street and dank blind buildings weeping with damp on the other. At once, this is a realistic description of an unlovely part of London and an existentialist vision of what's caused its decline. A body dumped outside a charismatic church that both God and his flock have long since deserted, on a thoroughfare that doesn't really exist, but alludes instead to Coleridge's rhyme of the ancient mariner, for reasons that will shortly become clear. The journey to Albatross Road is a story of crime and atonement few authors can rival, being as Derek Raymond is the only one of them to have spent the early 60s working for associates of Reg and Ronnie Cray, after having been sent down from the same institution that just brought us David Cameron. <laughs> the erstwhile Robert William Arthur Cook, born in Baker Street in 1931, saw both sides of the class and criminal divide during his remarkable lifetime. An Eton background, he always said, is a terrific help if you're into vice of any kind. <laughs> His first novel, 1962's The Crust on Its Uppers, described exactly the capers the youthful cook got up to, art smuggling, running long firms and bent casinos out of King's Rage Spielers. The book was laced with so much criminal parlance it provided its own dictionary. From the city that invented the term, the use of shortened language in the codes of the streets are all essential components of the books I'll talk about today. And in lacing his prose with Argot, Cook was following a tradition of 30s and 40s writers he admired, the American hardboiled greats Jim Thompson, Raymond Chandler and David Goodis, and their lesser-known British contemporaries, Gerald Kirsch, Patrick Hamilton and Alexander Barron, whose underworld landscapes of tatty bedsits and shabby nightclubs, haunted by con men, fascists and tarts, show a vivid connection with his own. But those names were long forgotten in 1984, and he died with his eyes open, appeared like a lone voice shouting against the crowd. Cook had been absent from London for decades. He'd spent most of the 70s in Italy, writing satires like Private Parts, Public Places, and the nightmare dystopia, A State of Denmark. 
there was a brief, grim sojourn spent back in the capital, behind the wheel of a minicab, before he retreated to France in the life of a labourer. Then a neighbour goaded him that he'd never write a book again. His response was an act symbolic with death and rebirth. The narrator of the passage I just read is an unnamed detective sergeant, working a grim adjunct of the Met called A14, Unexplained Deaths. We work on obscure, unimportant, irrelevant deaths of people who don't matter and never did, as he goes on to explain. The DS is a 40-something with no ambitions for promotion, a failed husband and father, haunted by the spectres of his institutionalised wife Edie and their daughter Dahlia, whom Edie pushed under a bus on the afternoon of Hitler's birthday, April the 20th, 1979. Where I go, the ghosts go, the DS considers. His only solace comes from working the beat no one else wants, avenging the unquiet, uncared for dead. The man the DS hovers over at the opening of He Dies With His Eyes Open was once Charles Stanerland, 51, wearing a cheap suit and a boozer's nose. He's been systematically beaten to death. The DS discovers Stanerland's past through a series of cassette tapes left in his bedsit in Romilly Place, Lewisham. Stanerland had variously worked as a minicab driver, a labourer on a French vineyard, and a writer with a strong sense of social conscience. It is the old Robin Cook who lies broken on Albatross Road. The newly rechristened Derek Raymond, his purpose finally realised, stands in the rain beside him. Raymond's new persona continued to work his lonely and often terrifying beat for five more groundbreaking novels, The Devil's Home on Leave, How the Dead Live, I Was Dora Suarez and Dead Man Upright, until the author's death in 1993. His DS stalks an ungentrified city, grim housing estates on the Elephant, dreary terraces in Catford, the crumbling remains of Rotherhithe docks, villains pubs with darkly humorous monikers, the nine-foot drop in Hammersmith, the Henry of Agincourt in Battersea, sex clubs in Soho, where atrocities against women are served up as entertainment, all circling back to his base in West One, whose moniker would bestow these novels with a collective name. It's called The Factory by the Villains because it has a bad reputation for doing subjects over in the interrogation rooms. People who still think our British policemen are wonderful ought to spend a night or three in a factory, banged up or put under the light by a team of three. We call it the factory too, but if you want to know, it's the big modern concrete police station in Poland Street, bang opposite Marks and Sparks. Raymond's London streets form geographical flashpoints to which our next authors will return. Already his life is intertwined with the next of them. In the months before he died, Raymond was looked after by John Williams, the Cardiff-born writer who is now his literary executor, responsible for the recent reissues of the Factory series on Serpent's Tail. Williams has probably had the most active role of anyone in creating contemporary voices in crime fiction, both in his role as an editor for the aforementioned imprint and through the impact of his own writing. A former punk rocker, Williams followed his musical muse up to London in the 70s, where he worked as a journalist and in various book and record shops. It was while devouring the stock of the much-missed Compendium bookstore in Camden that he had an idea for a study of an emerging new wave of American writers whose work would prove as influential as Raymond's. His resulting travelogue, 91's Into the Badlands, focused on authors who had big things to say about society and whose work was infused with an intoxicating sense of place. Of them all, it was James Elroy, whose LA quartet began with the story of a doomed girl dubbed the Black Dahlia and wove an intricate secret history of his home city who would have the most critical impact on our writers to come. Williams applied the methodology of memory and place to his own London novel. Published in 97, but set between 81 and 84, Faithless is a smart noir about how the ambitious 80s stole up on the idealistic dreams of the 70s. It opens with a sublime evocation of Camden's old main drag and the generation he came of age in the years between punk and Thatcher. Squatters and punks, all in bands, all at home on this dirty stretch of high street, with its once run-down dance hall turned rock and roll flea pit, its hippie bookshop and record store, its miserable Irish pubs and grisly cafes. And now, goes on his narrator Jeff, I was looking at what we'd done to it. Driven out the butcher, the baker and the Indian grocer, lost the locksmith, the fishmonger and the TV repair shop. 
dismantled the co-op, the printers and the halal shop, replaced them all with leather jacket shops and multicoloured Dr Martin's Emporia, the youth culture capital of Europe, the marketplace of cool. At the beginning of the novel, Jeff captures a glimpse of a girl he was once involved with. As an example of that leap in time I was talking about earlier, there's something about her that makes the hair stand up on the back of the neck. She wore boxing boots from Lonsdale's and Carrot called herself a boy's name to prove it. She was tall and dark, but wore black tights, had her hair up in a ponytail, rockabilly style. Big almond eyes, jet black hair. Italian, I suppose, going by her name. She was North London anyway. Turns out, she's Jewish North London. Her name, like that of Amy Winehouse's first album, is Frank. Is it a ghost of Camden Town's past or its future that Jeff sees, reflected through the glass of Burger King's window, disappearing into the night? Whichever, William's abilities to predict the future of crime fiction remained unerring with his signing for Serpent's Tale of the Galway writer Ken Bruin in 1996. Another man with an itinerant past, Bruin had worked as a security guard on the Twin Towers and as a foreign language teacher in Vietnam and South America, where he endured a life-altering three-month incarceration in a Brazilian jail. He was the first in his family to attend university. He gained a PhD in metaphysics at Trinity College, Dublin, which proved anathema to his parents. The only book in our home was the Bible, Bruin recalled. My parents forbade books. They thought I needed help because I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> Instead, Bruin wrote crime fiction spiked with his literary and musical loves, set in the South London streets where he was working as a teacher at the end of the 90s. Rilke on Black, his story of a motley band of kidnappers and their business and prey, was, he once told me, an attempt to get his students to appreciate the poetry of Rainer Maria Rilke by having a suave gangster rapping his lines. One character who appears at the end of Rilke would go on to take centre stage in Bruin's breakthrough series, the endearingly nihilistic Detective Sergeant Brand. Like his creator, Brand is an Irish renegade with a drop of bad blood, the rogue gene that Bruin considers saved him from the direst of torments of his past. He forms one third of a leading trio of coppers who propel the series that began with a white arrest for the Do Not Press in 98. R and B, they were called, Bruin expounds. If Chief Inspector Roberts was like the rhythm, then Detective Sergeant Brandt was the darkest blues. WPC Falls is more taken with country and western, probably because her love life resembles the, tear the lyrics of a tear-stained Dolly Parton classic. And no wonder. The villains these three will chase and often fail to catch throughout a white arrest. 99's Taming the Alien and 2000's The McDead include a serial killer intent on offing the England cricket squad and a psychopathic rapist for whom Falls has to act as bait. Their beat is a Lambeth Southwark triangle between Brixton, Oval and the Elephant, bordered by the villainous hub of the cricketer's pub, Cold Harbour Lane, where vigilante gangs plot against the dealers of Railton Road, and the spirit of Athens Taverna on Walworth Road, where Mezzi and Moonshine are served up by snitches. Bruin's prose is a heady mix of the ultra-hard-boiled familiar from American crime fiction and his own unique and addictive form of non-linear poetry. There are always a supporting cast of itinerants in his tales, big issue vendors who act as the unseen eyes of the city with surprising past histories. Take this fellow, who appears before DCI Roberts in The McDead. A minicab later and he arrived in Stockwell, where the pit bulls travelled in twos. Ludlow Road is near the tube station, a short mugging away. At that hour, the streets were littered with the undead, the lost and the frozen. The building was a warren of bedsits, no lock on the front door. A whiner was spread in the hall, his head came up wheezed, Is it Tuesday? No. Roberts wondered if the guy even knew what he or it was, but hey, he was going to argue. He said, It's Thursday, OK? Oh, good. I play golf on Tuesdays. <laughs> Both Bruin and William's work would appear in a pivotal tome from 97. Fresh Blood 2, also on the Do Not Press, presented the strongest new voices in UK crime fiction at the time. But its standout contribution didn't come from an adherent of the genre. 
Ian Sinclair had been tramping the Tensides route since the 70s, weaving history into a trilogy of work that began with the prose poems Lud Heat in 75 and Suicide Bridge in 81, before exploding into a fever dream of a novel, Whitechapel Scarlet Tracings in 1987. During that time, Sinclair worked as a labourer to sustain his writing, cutting grass in East London graveyards, rolling barrels in Treeman's Brewery, Brick Lane, and crossing the country in pursuit of rare editions in a supplementary trade as a book dealer, all of which fed into Whitechapel's scarlet tracings. <clears throat> this dense, hallucinogenic triple narrative conjures the twin spectres of London's most iconic detective and villain, Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper, backed off onto London shrouded in the shadows and fog of Thatcher's malevolent reign. In my work, Sinclair explained, the pains of the past need to be appeased, or else they come back. In one thread, book dealer Nicholas Lane finds a rare edition of a study in Scarlet in a rain-sodden Fenland village, and brings it back to London in the hope of turning it into a fortune. In a parallel, a century previously, the infant William Gull watches his dead father's Thames barge bearing the cholera-stricken paternal body away. Gull becomes an eminent Victorian surgeon, keeper of royal secrets and clandestine butcher of Whitechapel working girls. The author weaves between these dialogues, following the smell of violets through Hawksmoor churchyards, Farringdon Road bookstalls, the footsteps of Blake's London. But most through midnight streets I hear, he quotes, how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. In Fresh Blood 2, Sinclair looked back to more recent East End past to summon a prophecy for the future of crime fiction. No More Yoga of the Nightclub, named after a Jar Wobble song, centres on the doomed figure of Jack the Hat McVitie, the gangster murdered by Reggie Cray. Sinclair's Jack steams through this story on a narcotic bender, throwing abuse and ashtrays at Dorothy Squires, knocking off bookies, calling Ron Cray a fairy in front of his assembled firm. As the author contests, he wills his own death, ends up doomed to spend each night forever as a shade, endlessly repeating his last night on earth. In his introduction to the piece, Sinclair expands on his interest in the Cray twins and their circle. He concludes that the whole era is in need of revisiting, but it needs a James Elroy to take hold of them, to shape a narrative from the brutal farce of their paranoid monologues. Enter Jake Arnold. An escapee from Aylesbury, a bright grammar school boy who fled from his father's aspirations of a middle management future and ended up working as a mortuary assistant in University Co College Hospital. An adolescent struggling with conflicting sexual impulses, he came out as a bisexual in his 20s. An angry young man of punk vintage who served time in South London, Scotland, involved in endless marches, demos and meetings. Who better to seize that narrative and follow its course through three decades of epic pop history until the crimes of Reg and Ron become transmogrified into 90s lad mag culture and the caper films of posh boys in search of a bit of rough. <laughs> Arnott sets out his stall in the frontispiece of 99's The Long Firm, quoting Bertolt Brecht from the Threepenny Opera. What's breaking into a bank compared to founding one? Harry Starks, his central figure, was cast partly from Brecht's aspirational villain McHeath and partly from Ron Cray, a homosexual gangster who yearns to turn his rackets into legitimate business, a blackmail artist working his way up through MPs and businessmen with similar proclivities that can be usefully exploited, a man who is at once at ease with his gayness and in no mind to have it legalised, and a bitter disappointment to his father, a Jewish communist who once wore Oswald Mosley's black shirts on Cable Street. Arnott demonstrates an outsider's eye for detail, the clandestine codes that will unlock the metaphorical green door into the secret worlds beyond. This is how, seen through the eyes of the long firm's first narrator, would be wide boy Terry, Harry makes his entrance in the Casbah Lounge coffee bar. A group of Earl's Court Queens were there with cheap Polari sophistication. Varda this, Varda that, casual bitchiness judging by anyone's fleeting object of affection. Then he came in, thick set in a dark suit and tightly knotted tie, looking out of place amid all the loud clothes the young homos were sporting, standing out sombre and heavy amongst the bright shirts and hipster slacks from Vince or Lord John. 
He looked around the coffee bar, negotiating all the signals, all the brief flashes of eye contact with a weary frown, as if his imposing presence was a burden. He looked clumsy and awkward, intimidated for all his toughness. All the looks, the staring. In the places he was more used to, spielers, drinking clubs, heavy boozers like the blind beggar of the grave Morris. That level of eyeballing would have seemed an affront, a prelude to combat. Here he had to get used to the fierce looks and learn a new way of staring. Arnott's second narrator, dissolute peer Teddy Thursby, is a dead ringer for the late Lord Robert Boothby. Like James Ulroy, Arnott shapes events from a history obscured by smart lawyers. In real life, when the Daily Mirror got, rid of Be- got wind of Boothby's amorous associations with Ron Cray, Harold Wilson's mixed to fix it, and later Lord Chancellor Arnold Goodman MP offered to represent the Tory peer in a libel action. The resultant payout and apology from the paper put the kibosh on any similar claims from Fleet Street. This cross-party cooperation is perhaps explained in the long firm when, shortly after receiving his title, Thursby is introduced to Harry at a sex party by the staggeringly indiscreet Labour MP Tom Dryberg. (laughs) Joining Terry and Thursby in this caper is actress Ruby Ryder, a rank starlet with touching similarity to Barbara Windsor, who marries one of Harry's firm, cat burglar Eddie Doyle. Ruby becomes Starks' beard when Eddie goes away for a stretch, helping Harry transform his stardust class from showbiz dyes to raunchy review bar as the sex industry creeps into those streets known to cabbies as the Dirty Dozen. But bustling, bursting through the middle of the book, with his trousers round his ankles and a pork pie hat covering his shame, is the realisation of Sinclair's prophecy. Jack the Hat McVitty rides again. <laughs> it starts like this. So O square. <clears throat> park the cream and blue Mark II Zodiac and walk around to the Flamingo on Wardour Street. Mod Club. Spade music blurring out below the pavement. R&B, soul they call it. Tip some app room at the doorman and slip him a note with a sly grin. In. Downstairs. Check the nag in the inside seat pocket. Pills. All kinds. Purple arts, French blues, nigger minstrels, black bombers. Enough to keep those mod boys and girls dancing all night to that spade music. New record starts. Needle scratch static. Engine noise. Rat tat Gunfire. Car tiles squealing. Crash. A leery voice mouths off. Al Capone's guns don't argue. In the long firm, Jack is ducking and diving between the Crays, the Richardsons and Starks as ganglions of the wild east, sinister south and way out west end. Spinning and weaving between youth cultures as he doles out deeds to the modernists and their descendants. Hippies and Hampstead in medicine in back with a near-fatal dose of self-realisation in the form of an acid tab. And bald heads, as he dubs the adherents of this new scar sound, revealed to Jack by his youthful accomplice Beardsley. Fittingly, in this cross-pollinating London underworld, Jamaican singer Prince Buster's ode to Chicago's mafia boss is the soundtrack to McFitty's mad, spiralling descent. Which finishes up like this. Up the stairs to the front door and in. Soul music coming up from the basement. Go downstairs. Chick, chick, chick. Where's the party, I say? Jack's here. Where's all the booze? Where are all the birds? Go into the basement room. No birds, no booze. Just a couple of boys dancing together. Fat Ron sitting on a sofa watching them, leering. Toad like eyes blink over me. Red just behind me pulls out a gun. Cold metal against my head. You've got it coming to you, Jack the At. Do him, Ron hisses. The long firm ends with the confessions of a fifth character, radical criminologist Lenny, whose spell teaching at Longmarsh Prison makes a star pupil out of Harry Starks, incarcerated since 1969. Now it's 1979, and Lenny's world is tilting on its axis, the pleasures of free love curtailed when his long-suffering girlfriend takes up with his student bit on the side his proto-punk pupils sneering at his hippie long hair, and the paper he's spent a decade researching, thoroughly intellectually trashed by its subject. When Harry makes an audacious jailbreak, Lenny crosses the divide and becomes his accomplice, helping Starks abscond to Morocco. 
en not perceives the link between the social up upheavals of the 60s into the inflammatory politics of the 70s and 80s in his next book, 2001, He Kills Coppers. He opens on another key cultural flashback, London 1966, the summer of England's World Cup victory. We're back in the West End, getting a taste of what forged Derek Raymond's fictitious factory through the eyes of newly promoted detective Frank Taylor. West End Central, Savile Row, C Division, crowded crime room briefing, Nipper Reed out front giving it the spiel, clamped down on vice in Soho, reinforcements drafted in to swamp the patch, subtle ints, West End Central needs a bit of a clean up itself. The area has a reputation, nasty rumours about officers on the take, newly appointed DCI Nipper wants to change all that apparently. Taylor describes himself as a little bit bent for the job. Unlike his scrupulous best friend Dave Thomas, still plodding the dull beat of Shepherd's Bush, Frank wants to get on. But it's in Shepherd's Bush that Taylor's destiny awaits. Meanwhile, tabloid reporter Tony Meehan is chasing another story. Dazzled by Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, he makes an unsuccessful attempt to solicit Ronnie Craw's, Craw's memoirs in a meeting set up by his loose young friend Julian. Tony has more than a passing interest in the mechanics of the criminal mind. He has his own secret life as a psychopathic killer. Brief spells of murderous frenzy punctuate his tightly contained existence. Indeed, he will later end up smothering the ageing Teddy Thursby in order to get his hands on the peer's explosive diaries. After being knocked back by Ron, Tony follows Julian across town to Notting Hill and an audience of a different kind. Here are new worlds colliding. It was the basement of a bookshop on Kensington Park Road, a motley crew assembled. Beards, beads, multicoloured clothes, peace sign badges. Everyone talking about utopia, peace, liberation, revolution, love. God, did they go on about love. <laughs> Julia and I both stood out as being the only people in the room with short hair and ordinary clothes. I guess they must have fought us real squares. This bunch of well-spoken hippies like to call themselves freaks, as if it was something glamorous and bohemian as if they had any idea what horror it was to be a real freak. Mm -hmm. We went for a drink afterwards, <laughs> Henneke's on Portobello Road. It was full of freaks. <laughs> Not very beautiful, are they? I commented, the beautiful people. Interestingly, this bookshop is based on a real-life enterprise of artist Brian Catlin, who would later escort Ian Sinclair around the Ripperlands of Whitechapel. A tipping of a pork pie hat, perhaps. Back in He Kills Coppers, a vengeful Tony sets up a drugs bust in Henneke's, which puts him first on the spot when three policemen, among them his best mate Dave Thomas, are gunned down by a trio of small-time crooks led by ex-serviceman Billy Porter. Porter's based on Harry Roberts, who remains incarcerated for the crimes he committed in the summer of 66, one of the UK's longest-serving criminals. Roberts did his national service for the British Army during the 1956 guerrilla war in Malaya, where he claimed to have acquired a taste for killing, a scenario Arnott reimagines for his fictitious porter. But following the shootings, Porter's path diverges from Roberts. Arnott's Billy gets away, using the survival skills learned from the army, remains undetected for long enough to establish a new life for himself working on the fringes of the travelling community, changing his identity to that of Mick, who paints fairground rides. But Frank Taylor hasn't forgotten him. Neither has Tony, who reimagines his In Cold Blood as the investigation that will lead to Porter's capture. And neither of the football hooligans is sing his name as they mash each other up on the terraces to the, lunge of London, to the tune of London bridges falling down. Billy Porter is our friend, is our friend, is our friend. Billy Porter is our friend, he kills coppers. <laughs> Still living as Mick, and involved with a group of peace protesters, Billy himself doesn't hear this chant until a 1985 demo at Greenham, Greenham Common. An altercation follows that leads him back to London in the company of some budding anarchists who have no idea who Mick really is. Neither can Mick much recognise this London from the one he left in '66. A whole square had been taken over by squatters. Half derelict houses had been renovated in a haphazard way. Windows fixed with what was at hand, plumbing improvised, front doors painted garishly in a bricolage of occupation. There's graffiti on the walls. No crews, meet as murder, stop the city, eat the rich. 
strange, apocalyptic warnings. Mick secures cash and handwork, renovating old warehouses and Docklands as the city shapeshifts into Margaret Thatcher's will. Here he witnesses the end of another era. There was a big demonstration outside the new premises of the Sunday Illustrated in Docklands. A group of young men covered their faces and busied themselves hurling missiles at the police lines. They're just bloody hooligans, really, Mick thought. And they'd sing that song again, the Billy Porter song. It sent a shiver down his spine. Time's soon up for Mick, for Billy, and for Frank Taylor's dream of confronting the man who stole his best friend's life. But all is not lost for Tony Meehan. At the beginning of 95's true crime, he's got himself a job ghostwriting for the Greenbridge Press, specialist in celebrity gangster memoirs. The subject is Eddie Doyle, the former Starks associate and erstwhile husband of Ruby Ryder. Eddie's just come out of a 12 stretch for his part in the 1983 Hounslow bullion, girl bullion heist, 15 million quid's worth that still remains hidden. God, Tony Sense has a golden opportunity. Meanwhile, Julie Kincaid is living a lie, masquerading as an actress to please her mother, a former stardust showgirl, while being haunted in her dreams by her murdered gangster father. Julie's the daughter of another Stark's accomplice, Big Jock McCluskey, gunned down by Harry's Spanish hideaway at the end of the long firm. When her Trustafarian boyfriend Jez starts work on a screenplay called Scrapyard Bulldog, Judy finds herself conspiring with him as a way of confronting her ghosts. Then there's the man through whose eyes we see the decades unfurl, a protégé of Jack the Hat's old psychic Beardsley, Marlene boy made good Gas Kelly. Gas has been working with Beardsley since the 70s in various rackets connected to music and drugs. His frequent incarcerations and subsequent attempts to reintegrate into a world that has changed beyond his comprehension provide the book's richest comedy material. When he comes out of his first long stretch in 82, Gaz is still wearing the skinhead threads that would de rigueur with his intercity firm comrades two years previously. Now he gets squeezed by a gay man wearing the same clobber. <laughs> it's the hooligans who are wearing the pastel knitwear now. Puffs dressed as hooligans, hooligans dressed like puffs. Well, I thought I'd seen it all now, he recounts. <laughs> but he hasn't. London changes before Gaz is incredulous eyes many times again. Next, it's the rave scene. M25 parties arranged on pages by enterprising young toff Ben Holroyd Carter. Getting wind of the money to be made, Beardsley's crew seem to see off Ben HB. But the next time Gaz claps eyes on him, Ben's got an empire the Grieve Corporation, run out of a converted warehouse on the docks, and is on his way for sh to number 10 for champagne with Tony Blair. <laughs> As though he's cleaned up, Gaz ends up com comparing at the Comedy Club, the latest incarnation of the Starlight. Through this, he gets bit part work as an actor, ends up taking one of the leads in Scrapyard Bulldog, and the world of celebrity opens up. Arnott catches the 180-degree spin of criminally cool Britannia with his recounting of Ronnie Cray's final send-off, the passing of the old East End into legend. A monster's funeral. The churchyard teeming with old lags and young wannabes. A phalanx of bouncers, the cream of London storemen, formed a guard of dishonour around the lich gate. A police -like helicopter buzzed overhead. The hearse arrived. Black and gold, glass-sided carriage, drawn by six black plumed horses. Victoriana Kitch, just as he would have wanted. The last Empire hero. Wreaths and flowered tributes to the grand old psychopath, Ron and the Colonel. One from Reggie, his wingmate, the other half of me, like a floral expression of schizophrenia. It's the East End that brings us to our next writer. He grew up one road away from Cable Street and spent his childhood ensconced in Whitechapel Library. But the stories this writer grew up to tell us are an insight to a different terrain. Dreda Say Mitchell, the daughter of Windrush generation immigrants from Grenada, is the first to tell the secret history of London from a West Indian perspective. Though her life was shaped by typically wayward impulses. A promising schoolgirl athlete, Mitchell shocked her teachers by quitting the sporting life to follow academia. As she recalled, she didn't want to be channelled into the expected avenues of black youth within the education system. She wanted to find out about history instead, the history not taught on the national curriculum. After taking a degree at the School of Oriental and African Studies, she embarked on a career as a teacher. But she began to feel her young self calling her back from the Library of Memory, started to shape the story from the streets where she grew up. 
Running Hot, Mitchell's 2004 debut, evinced a very different gangland to the one we left at St Matthew's Bethnal Green. This is Dalston Junction, seven years after Ron Cray's funeral. Mehmet Ali lay in East London's number one outdoor spot to die. Two doors down from Kwame's hotshot barbers and three doors up from Raisinland's cabs. Over him rocked the bodies of two men as they stomped, twisted and sliced their shoe heels into him. An hour earlier, his attackers had been jerking their bodies round to the pounding energy of Judge Dredd's night sound. Now they continued their dance. After they'd found him, as they knew they would, they dragged him to Cinnamon Junction right on the main road. They'd known this spot was too notorious, too in your face for any of the cars passing on Monday at 2.23am to stop and help. Anyway, any car cruising the junction that time of morning had its own business to attend to. This is the story of Elijah Schoolboy Hammond, who dreams of escape from those streets where treading on someone's footwear could mean being permanently taken out of the life. Knives are on Schoolboy's mind as the book opens. Chef's knives. The offer he's been made to apprentice at a restaurant in Devon is conditional on him turning up with a proper kit. Opportunity presents itself outside Cinnamon Junction when he stumbles over Mehmet Ali's body and picks up a mobile lying by the corpse. If schoolboy can convert the phone into the 40 quid he needs, he can be on the first West Coast main line out of there. Trouble is, the mobile's a connection between two rival gangs. What follows is a hyper adrenalised rush through seven days in the streets of Hackney's Murder Mile, as schoolboy shadow boxes between his pursuers to get to Paddington Station. Winner of the 2004 Crime Writers Association debut dagger, Running Hot was the beginning of an incendiary career for Mitchell. Yet, yeah. There are haunting echoes in this landscape of a previous novel, set in the Hackney of 1963. Written by the late Alexander Barron and recently republished by Black Spring Press with a foreword by Ian Sinclair, The Low Life tells the story of Jewish Chancellor Harry Boy Boas and the life he lives in Ingram's Terrace, part of a street that joins Stoke Newington High Street to next to Amherst Road, not far north of Dalston Junction. And here's how it was in Harry Boy's day. All is quiet and clean. Negroes have come to live, more every month. Every Sunday morning they all go to the Baptist church on the I Street. You should see them men, in beautiful pearl grey suits and old-fashioned trilbies with curled brims. The women full of dignity and the little girls in white muslin and bonnets. It slays me. They're the Victorian residents of this street, come back a century later with black skins. The people in Ingram's terrace don't mix, but they all say good morning to each other. I never smell any hatred between one kind and another, nor even an ember that might flare up in the future. Just as sadly wrong Harry Boy's prediction would turn out to be, is laid bare in Mitchell's next novel, 2007's Killer Tune, which tells the stories of upcoming rapper Lord Tribulation, or LT, and his father King Stir It Up, a veteran musician who came through the sound systems of the 70s. The crime at the centre of the book, which ripples out 30 years from 1976, emanates from a house slap bang in the middle of Harry Boy's former manor. As the story begins, LT is teetering on the brink of a life-changing record deal while his father, the King, languishes in hospital, nearing the end of his own days, being interviewed by a young journalist about the history of Notting Hill Carnival. The King doesn't get to finish answering her questions. He's distracted by a scene unfurling outside. A black youth wearing a do-rag and a deliberate imitation of LT's trademark style has just launched a Molotov cocktail at the house opposite. Shortly after, the king gets a phone call and absconds from hospital. His body is found in a back alley in Hoxton, an area of the city he detested. In the aftermath of this and the barrage of controversy ignited by the firebombing incident, LT is compelled to investigate the circumstances of his father's suspicious demise. As in he died with his eyes open, the murdered man has left clues of the finding of his assailants in a series of tape recordings. These tell a whole alternate history of London and what happened to those regal Victorian Negroes in the years since Harry Boy moved on. In the book's most chilling passage, we get to find out why the King hated Hoxton. After a day at the Notting Hill Carnival in 84, he and LT got stranded on the wrong side of Commercial Road to be after hours. They reach the intersection where Shoreditch High Street becomes Kingsland Road. 
Suddenly, the pressure of the king's hand pulled LT back, made him stop, as if the king was stopping them both from crossing into a minefield. It was some years later that LT realised that crossing that street meant they were going to be entering what the locals called the Hate Estate. The southwest of Hackney, that ran from Hoxton to Haggerston and threaded Three Brick Lane and Bethnal Green, was the homeland of the National Front. They moved quickly walking swiftly past to George Davis's innocent slogan painted in white on the wall. They kept moving. For one minute, three minutes, five minutes, they left the darkness of the bridge behind them and reached the open road again. They hit the bend where Fulcock Street touches the main road on its left. That was when they heard the voices. Male, boisterous, singing, with the crude aroma of alcohol in the main melody. He could not make out the words of their song, but the acoustics of the Haight estate told him they were coming from Haggerston across the road. The trail the king has left for LT leads back to the square where the firebombing takes place and the 70s headquarters of the Liberation Republic, a movement with parallels to the Hackney Black People's Association and echoes of Michael X's Black House in Holloway Road, a story re-examined by John Williams in his 2008 biography, Michael X. The King discovers the Liberation Republic after a night spent in the souls of Unity Road Police Station, a metaphor for several actual stations in the district, and the troubling history of relations between police and the black community, from the death of Colin Roach in the custody of Stoke Newington Police in January 83, right up to the shooting of Mark Duggan by Operation Trident officers in August last year. The King's cellmate is a man named Houdini, for reasons that soon become clear. He's got a lawyer to bring the two of them in double-quick time. Intrigued by the man in the group he represents, the king is drawn into their world, which is not exactly all it seems. LT's investigation uncovers a clandestine collusion between a mainstream politician and a one-time radical that feeds off the fear and misunderstanding within the very communities they're supposed to represent. As in Bruin's White Trilogy and Arnott's London Cycle, Mitchell's streets were alive with the sound of music. Killer Tune grieves to a history of the city through beats fashioned within its streets and the dreams of the people who made them, fusing pop culture with real events and their ever-attendant supporting feature, urban myth. Which brings me, finally, to a pair of detectives who have seen all these London stories unfold and more. In the books of Christopher Fowler, Arthur Bryant and John May are veterans of the Met's Peculiar Crimes Unit, set up during the Second World War to tackle crimes of a sensitive nature. A time of desperation when a great many experimental ideas were proposed by the Churchill government, including the employment of Dennis Wheatley, the horror story writer, as a member of the War Cabinet. Six decades later, no government has yet been able to disband the operation. Fowler's octogenarian detectives are outsiders working undercover and frequently right up the nose of the establishment. Bryant, the perennial scruff with boiled sweets and worse stuck in his pockets, has a head full of arcane knowledge and snouts that include a coven of white witches. May, a bane in a Savile Row suit, is the man of reason, constantly adapting to the ever-changing capital, embracing new technology and tapping up rogue computer hackers for tips. Aided by a revolving cast of disgruntled ex-coppers, scheming civil servants and unruly pathologists, Bryant and May traverse the districts of London, encountering every persuasion of the city's dwellers on their way. Each case is loaded with 14 facts, including the location of their base in an office above Mornington Crescent's tube station, evoking both the cult game on Radio 4's I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue and the lodgings of the Victorian artist Walter Sickert, claimed by some theorists, including the American crime writer Patricia Cormor, to be the real Jack the Ripper. Fowler's books revel in such linkage, that he subverts the format of the so-called golden age of 30s crime fiction in the telling of them just strengthens their charm. Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot would never have tangled with the Leicester Square vampire or the Deptford demon, but Dennis Wheatley's Duke de Richelieu might. Fowler himself was denied the pleasure of books as a child, His Green Carnation Award-winning memoir, Paperboy, describes a dreary early existence in 1950s Greenwich, blighted by a tyrannical father who raged against the idea of his son being made out of paper. Fowler's senior's reading matter was limited to a volume about bomb-making. 
Junior rebelled by devouring everything from cornflake plackets to a verboten copy of War and Peace, which he declaimed to his pet tortoise. By the age of 24, Fowler had set up his own film company, Creative Partnership. Four years later, he'd moved the company to America and, frustrated by long stretches between jobs, turned his hand to writing short stories. His neighbour, the horror author Clive Barker, passed on Fowler's debut collection to his editor and a genre-straddling career as a horror, sci-fi and crime writer began. London is a presence in most of Fowler's work, but it's with Brian and May that his encyclopedic knowledge and thirst to know more about the city runs rampant. My favourite is 2008's The Victoria Vanishes, which delves into those cornerstones of London life most beloved of thirsty writers, pubs. It begins with the seemingly impossible. After attending a wake, a slightly worse for where Arthur Bryant weaves a course back to Mornington Crescent from Charing Cross Road. Slipping into Argyle Walk, a slender alley tucked behind Euston Road, he finds a tiny part of London that's never revealed itself to him before. He notes a corner pub, the Victoria Cross, with a sign above it depicting its namesake, the highest recognition for bravery in the face of the enemy that could be awarded to any member of the British and Commonwealth Armed Forces. Beneath the sign were opaque lower windows, gold letters and a spotted mural panel establishing the types of beers served on foundation date. A deserted bar unit, mirrored and shelved, where bottles of whiskey and gin remained in places they had doubtless occupied for decades. As Bryant observes his surroundings, a middle-aged woman stumbles drunkenly across the road, staring up at the pub sign before entering. Bryant dismisses the surreal atmosphere of this tiny thoroughfare until the woman, 46-year-old Carol Winley, is found dead on the corner where he last saw her, just minutes after he had departed. Bryant and May return to the scene to find the Victoria Cross has vanished. Instead, a convenience store stands on the same spot. To compound the mystery, other women have died in similar circumstances, and more are following. Naomi Curtis collapsed outside the Seven Stars pub, Hayburn. Jocelyn Rakesby inside the old Bell Tavern in Fleet Street. Joanne Callerman in the old Dr Butler's Head by London Wall. And Jasmina Sherwin in the beer garden of the Barnsbury King's Cross. Bryant is convinced that the locations of the crimes hold the key to the killer's identity. He consults a friend from the British Museum, an expert on the mythology and etymology of London named Dr Harold Masters. Masters not only agrees, he goes one further. The killer's motive is to unpick the very fabric of the nation. If you wish to undermine everything we stand for as a people, you could do no better than damage the institution of the pub, he expands. <laughs> The PCU's investigation becomes one mammoth crawl of London's hostelries and the societies who meet within them. Like the Conspiracy Club, who meet in the Sutton Arms near Smithfield Market, the Phobia Society at the Ship and Shovel off the Strand, and the Grand Order of London Immortals in the Yorkshire Grey and Langham Place. These groups have one thing in common, the desire to discuss ideas and theories outside the narrow parameters of the partisan and conservative mainstream press. The great philosophers of London and their natural habitat refuse to be controlled, not even by the smoking ban. At the point they make a major breakthrough in the case, Brian and May also discuss, discover something new about each other. May's wife Jane, whom Brian had long believed was dead, is a patient in a mental health institution, sent mad by the death of their daughter Elizabeth, killed by the Leicester Square vampire on a stakeout engineered by her father. The situation differs but the allusion to Derek Raymond's detective sergeant comes across as homage, another stitch in time. Though what finally connects the victims and their killer with Emmanuel Swedenberg, the MOD porting down in the blood of Christ, and how those forces conspire to make the Victoria vanish, are mysteries I shall not reveal. <laughs> but as Bryant would say, there's a pattern to everything. And so, I'd like to end this talk back at the beginning. We've walked the chartered streets through many different times and angles. It only seems appropriate to end with our elder statesman, Brian and May, standing as William Blake stood before them on a bridge above the chartered Thames. Where Blake saw the future in the satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution that inspired his immortal Jerusalem, Fowler's creations stare back through time, multiple visions of the city refracted through their eyes. London, the site of the Guy Fawkes plot, home of Newgate and Bedlam, 
the tarred heads of Jacobites on spikes at Temple Bar, the Cato Street Conspiracy, the Sydney Street Siege, the Gordon Wrights and the Lollards, Thomas Blood and the Stolen Crown Jewels, the Highway Robbers, John Cottington, Dick Turpin and Mole Cuphurst, John Sayer stabbed in the mint, Elizabeth Brownrigg torturing her maid, Jack the Ripper, the Craze, Ruth Ellis, Jonathan Wilde, Jack Shepherd, the Fenian Outrage of 1867, the Dynamite Plot of 1883, the Battle of Stepney, the Death of the Bomber Nordan, Charlie Peace, the Mannings, Franz Muller, the Railway Murderer, Crippen, Christian Nielsen, the Tichborne Claimant, the Smithfield Burnings, the Crowds at Tyburn Tree, Execution Whop at Whopping, the Ratcliffe Highway Murderers, the Shooters Hill Executions, the Scaffolds and Jails at Southwark, Bridewell, Clerkenwell, Wandsworth, Colbath Field, Ludgate, Millbank, Brixton, Holloway, Pentonville, Wormwood Scrubs, Fleet Street, St George Field, and the floating prison halts at Woolwich. An overwhelmingly populous timeline of death, desperation and the damned. You want to be here amongst it all. <laughs> For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.